evening, everyone. My name is Glenn Howard. I'm the president of the Jamestown Foundation. And we're really delighted that you can join us today for our program and webinar called China in Space. Uh, I know that there are many people watching us uh, from all over uh, in the United States. For those in the United States, certainly wish you a good morning. And for those in Asia, a good evening. Uh, as many of you know, uh, China has, been, has harbored uh, very strong aspirations for space. It started placing its astronauts in space in 2003. China has since then ra risen rapidly as a space power. It's led the world in the total number of space launches in 2018 and 2019. It has also completed about 22 launches just this year alone and plans on completing 40 by the end of 2020. As of 2019, China's space program had an estimated budget of $8 billion second only to the United States. What has been more impressive is China has started its uh, Chang Chang'e 4 lunar pro probe that made headlines uh, this summer when it was sent back the first pictures of the far side of the moon. Chinese officials have said the country hopes to uh, eventually establish a lunar base on the moon that could provide natural resources for the Earth, but also serve as a launching pad for further exploration. Chinese officials have indicated they plan to send a manned mission to the moon by 2030. Uh, and so we're really seeing Chinese ambitions continue to grow. On July 22nd, they launched a combined orbiter, lander, and rover to Mars. So if everything goes well, the rover is expected to land sometime in February. Uh, so this event just took place after, the ja after Japan and the United Arab Emirates launched a HOPE orbiter in, a, in, a, uh, in an effort to try to beat Matt NASA's Perseverance rovers, which was scheduled uh, to launch uh, in a week. Uh, however, China's program does not really encompass exploration. There's also a military and national security component to it as well. China's been developing anti-satellite uh, capabilities, directed energy and electronic warfare capabilities. Uh, in space as well as radio jamming technologies. Uh, and so we certainly have the, a, a great group of persons here today to try to, uh, to kind of assess these and discuss the, the future of the Chinese space program. Uh, and as many of you know, uh, China Brief Publication has been very, uh, very keen on covering and analyzing these developments regarding the Chinese uh, space program. So I'm going to turn the floor over now to John Dotson, the editor of our China Brief publication, who's going to uh, introduce our two distinguished speakers today, Dean, Dean Chung and, and Mark Stokes. Uh, so, uh, John, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, let's blast off here. All right. Thanks, Glenn. Um, and thanks to everyone for uh, joining us this morning uh, for this discussion. I think we are uh, very fortunate to have two uh, very distinguished uh, experts uh, who have written extensively about the, uh, the Chinese space program. Uh, first, we have with us uh, Dean Chung, who's a fellow with the uh, Heritage Foundation, working on uh, political and uh, security affairs, uh, primarily in, uh, in East Asia. Uh, before coming to Heritage, Dean worked for a number of years as an analyst with uh, SAIC and at the Center for Naval uh, Analyses. Uh, his research and writing has focused on Chinese, among other things, Chinese military doctrine uh, and multiple aspects of the space program to include its role in Chinese national strategy and much of the scientific infrastructure associated with the, uh, with the space program. He's also been a, a prominent commentator in a number of uh, major media outlets to include CNN, uh, BBC, uh, The Washington Post, Jane's, and the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, which at one time was a respected independent newspaper. We'll, we'll see where uh, what, what happens from here. Uh, but again, we're very fortunate to have him with us uh, here today. Our other speaker is going to be uh, uh, retired Lieutenant Colonel Mark Stokes. He's currently the executive director of the Project 2049 uh, Institute. Um, Mark is a 20-year veteran of the uh, U.S. Air Force, whose positions included an assignment as the assistant uh, air attache in, uh, in China in the early uh, 1990s as well as a, a tenure as the country director for China in the Office of uh, Secretary of Defense. And he has also written on uh, many aspects of the, uh, the Chinese military to include the, uh, the space program and the role of the PLA um, in, uh, in the space program. So we're also very fortunate to have him uh, with us uh, here today. Um, I think the first uh, for our speakers, I'll turn to Dean uh, first. So the, uh, the floor is yours, sir. Well, my thanks to the Jamestown Foundation uh, for the opportunity to be here today um, and to you uh, out there in the electronics land uh, for tuning in. Uh, so I'm going to try and uh, place China's space program in the context of its uh, national grand strategy. 
So the first thing to keep in mind is the concept of comprehensive national power. Uh, this is basically how the Chinese think about um, how they rack and stack, how they compare with other countries. How do you compare a Brazil, a France, a China, and the United States? Um, basically, it recognizes that military power is important, but it's not the only factor. The Chinese are very careful students of not only their own history, but other people's history. And one of the things they saw with the collapse of the Soviet Union was that military power by itself could not guarantee national survival or national growth and prosperity. So in addition, um, comprehensive national power also takes into account economic capacity. Do you have a strong, vibrant national economy? That in turn is also by itself insufficient. Look at Japan. In the 1980s, everyone knew Japan would be the next superpower. Today, Japan is still a, an economic superpower, but is nowhere near the, the, you know, the dominance that it had in the, the late 1980s. Other factors are political unity, uh, economic um, development, uh, science and technology, uh, diplomatic respect, and even cultural security. Uh, this is something that Hu Jintao, uh, Xi Jinping, even Deng Xiaoping made major emphases on, that cultural, are you proud to be Chinese? Do other people want to be like you? Space touches every one of these elements of comprehensive national power. And that's part of why the Chinese see space as so important, is that a space capability uh, improves all aspects of comprehensive national power, and in turn, comprehensive national power generates greater space capabilities. So you have, in essence, a virtuous cycle. So looking over the various pieces of comprehensive national power, let's start with economic. Um, the Chinese economy is important to note from their perspective. You know, from our perspective, it's the number two GDP in the world. Uh, if you go to Shanghai's Bund, if you go to Tsanganjie in Beijing, you think you were, you know, in uh, Tokyo, you were on the Kefirsten Dam, uh, you were on Bond Street. But from the Chinese perspective, remember, every dollar increase in GDP has to be spread over 1.3 billion people. So China's economy continues from their view to be still a developing economy. It is very lumpy in the sense that it's not evenly distributed. It is not generally advanced across the board. So China would like to see more high technology across the entire economy. It would like to see a more distributed set of national development. Space, in their view, can contribute. First off, as the Chinese like to say, space is very dense in high technology. If you think about a satellite, uh, if you think about space launch, it includes advanced materials. It includes by definition, uh, information technology, information and communication technology. It includes advanced manufacturing techniques. Um, it includes solar power, potentially, energy storage. Um, these are all very advanced. Above all, space requires systems integration and systems engineering. And so from the Chinese perspective, a strong space industrial complex will generate secondary effects that will ripple through the entire economy, making it more sophisticated, more advanced. Let's also keep in mind that um, if you have a, a, an advanced space capability and you export, you also generate foreign income. And here we see the Chinese exporting satellites to a variety of countries, uh, Nigeria, Venezuela. They are also pushing into space services. You now see commercial, really commercial, Chinese companies pushing space launch, pushing satellite applications, uh, Earth observation, uh, et cetera. Um, the Chinese, I think, have recognized that the future of space industry isn't necessarily in bending metal. Satellites can be expensive, but microsats, cubesats, a few tens of thousands of dollars at that, if that. Um, satellite application is at least as great a potential market area. Um, people really like overhead imagery. They news organizations, think tanks. Uh, if you take a look at the Asian uh, Maritime 
Transparency Initiative over at CSIS, they are built around satellite photographs of Southeast Asia. What well, once upon a time required the National Reconnaissance Office and the you know, workings of the US intelligence agencies. Now you can buy for relatively cheaply imagery that is on par with that level, certainly in the 1960s. Um, another aspect of economic benefit from the space industrial complex is that you are leveraging highly skilled personnel. The Chinese recognize that one of the things they have a shortage of is people who are familiar with systems integration, systems integration. And I think it's an accident that a number of people who used to work in the Chinese space industrial complex wound up over in Comac, commercial airline corporation, because designing a safe passenger airliner is in many ways also an act of systems integration and systems engineering. Um, moving on, we see that the Chinese also see space as important in contributing to domestic policy. Uh, space affects both domestic and foreign policy. In the domestic sense, first off, it promotes a pride in China, and especially in the Chinese Communist Party. China, as, as we heard at the very beginning, is now doing a variety of things that only a handful of other space powers can do. Go to Mars. Uh, the only countries that have actually gone to Mars successfully are U.S. and Russia. Um, hopefully the UAE will succeed, but so far, most of the missions have been by countries that now China joins those ranks. China, for a long time, was the only country alongside Russia that could put people in space. Thanks to Elon Musk, the U.S. is back in the human spaceflight business, but for a long time, the U.S. couldn't put its own astronauts into space. China could. So for the Chinese population, and more importantly for the Chinese Communist Party, the space program is intended to be symbolic of how far China has come and who brought it there. Um, economic development, as we said earlier, is an important part that feeds CCP legitimacy. Um, it also uh, is a means of giving pride to the Chinese people because their space program is heavily indigenous. One of the unfortunate things about a lot of the coverage of China's space program is this assumption that it's entirely built on stolen uh, capabilities. And people often point to the Senzo manned space capsule. Look, it's a big Soyuz. Well, not at exactly. It looks like a Soyuz, in part because the Chinese bought Russian docking technology. But the Senzo is substantially larger and generates more electrical power. The point here being that the Chinese have always associated their space program with indigenous development. The so-called two bombs, one satellite program, the key major S&T efforts of the 1960s were to develop an atomic bomb, a hydrogen bomb, the two bomb part, and a space launch capability, partly for the IBM aspect, but also because China wanted to develop a indigenous space capability. And to their credit, much of their space capability, whether it's Zanga for landing on the far side of the moon, whether it is the uh, data relay satellite that they deployed to Lagrange Point 2, whether it is um, the new DFH-5 bus uh, that is the core of new Chinese satellites, a lot of this was indigenously developed. And we do ourselves a disservice by thinking that they only uh, succeed by skill. Um, space, of course, ties directly to Chinese concepts of foreign policy. Uh, it is a diplomatic tool. It is a mechanism by which China can undertake both bilateral and multilateral space cooperation. Um, China is very proud of the fact that it was part of the so-called double star program with the European Space Agency. China was extremely angry when it participated in the opening stages of the Galileo, the European navigation satellite system, and then got booted off for, frankly, it's never really clear exactly what the circumstances are. Uh, China has used space to create its own international space organization, the Asia Pacific Space Cooperation Organization, which ties together countries like Thailand, Outer Mongolia, and Paris. Um, if there is domestic prestige and helping CCP legitimacy, there's also international prestige by, again, 
China being one of the countries at the very forefront of space capability and space exploration. And indeed, the Chinese like to point out that great powers are not only military powers and all the rest, but remember, in comprehensive national powers, there's also science and technology. In fact, that China can do original innovative science, like landing on the moon, is a exemplar of how China is a full-fledged great power, not just a military one. Um, and of course, you have access um, to hard currency and diplomatic impact. China has sold satellites to nations such as Nigeria, uh, Pakistan, uh, Belarus, and Laos. As you can imagine, all of these countries have geopolitical significance, war, economic significance. China is a net import of oil, Nigeria is a major export. Um, needless to say, the ability to access space at the time in, uh, of one's own choosing influences Taiwan, or from the Beijing's perspective, will hopefully influence Taiwan. It is a signal to Taiwan that we are watching. It doesn't have to be negative. Interestingly, when Sinzo Fai went up with China's first astronaut, apparently the Chinese sent a private message to Taipei saying, we're about to launch China's first person into space. Is there anything you'd like us to take up? Interestingly, the Taiwanese authorities apparently sent over a bag of seeds. It went up, it came back down, it came back with a little note saying, this certifies that this bag of seeds went into space with Yang Li Wei. Um, the Chinese were playing this to reinforce the point. This is a moment of glory for all Chinese people, including you, our compatriots on Taiwan. Um, it's an interesting political message. It's not necessarily an intimidating one, although it can be, but it's a reflection of how the Chinese think holistically. And then finally, the space role and the military. Here are a couple of key things to keep in mind. One, the Chinese see space, especially in the military context, holistically. So when they are thinking about space, they're not just thinking about what's in orbit, they're thinking about the terrestrial element, launch facilities, mission control facilities, space tracking facilities, and the data links that tie it all together. Second, the Chinese see future wars as revolving around joint operations, and joint operations here isn't just land, sea, and air force. It is multi-domain, land, sea, and air domain, the electromagnetic domain, and the outer space domain. So joint operations involving all of these domains and information dominance, because we now live in the information age, and the key to winning future wars is the ability to establish information dominance, the ability to gather information, transmit information, exploit information more rapidly and more accurately than your adversary, while at the same time denying them the same opportunity. For joint operations, the key is being able to share information, shared situational awareness, part of information dominance. Space from the PLA's perspective, People's Liberation Army's perspective, is vital at a minimum to deny an adversary that, particularly people like the United States, because our military, the way the American way of war is built on information. And then secondarily, servicing China's need for information. So what we see is a Chinese emphasis on both space deterrence, intimidating adversaries through the use of space, offensive space operations, the ability to deny an adversary, the ability to access or use space, defensive uh, space operations, the ability to keep their own space system operating, and space information. Those are the four broad mission areas for what is now the PLA Strategic Support Force. The, fo the focus here, the emphasis here, is that space, in a sense, for the PLA doesn't matter because what really matters is the information that transits over it. But because of that holistic view, what that also means is that counter space operations don't necessarily have to be anti-satellite weapons. In 2007, China tested an anti-satellite weapon, but what we have seen since is a variety of other Chinese activities, jamming and cyber being prominent among them. Because what matters to the Chinese is making sure that your space enterprise, sorry, no, no pun intended there, um, linking together your satellites, your terrestrial, and the data links that tie it all together, they don't work properly. So 
if your satellites are all in orbit, but you can't speak to them or you can't receive data because I have attacked your terrestrial facilities or I have cybered the data links, I can achieve space dominance and from their information dominance just as effectively as though I was um, killing your satellite systems. So let me conclude here by basically noting that China looks at space holistically. It looks at it holistically from a space perspective in terms of the three components. It looks at it holistically in the sense of how it ties back to national strategy. We have a national space strategy. Uh, we have a national defense strategy and national security strategy. They are interlinked. I would suggest that while China, we should expect to see a new Chinese space white paper probably at the end of this year or early next year, to talk about what they're going to do for the next five years. Their space strategy is much more deeply embedded in their concept of national strategy, which links back to comprehensive national power. Thank you very much. All right, Dean, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, we'll turn next to um, Mr. Stokes. Before we do, I'd like to remind all of our uh, viewers watching, uh, that we will be taking a Q&A after uh, Dean and Mark are finished speaking. And if any of you would like to offer a, a question, you can do that through the uh, chat window at the bottom of the, the Zoom screen uh, or uh, use the, uh, the raise hand function. But, best, uh, uh, but please type your questions into the uh, Q&A chat window and we'll uh, try to address those uh, as best we can, time allowing. But with that, I'll turn it over uh, to, uh, to you, Mark. Thank you, uh, John, and I'd also like to thank um, Jamestown Foundation for inviting me to speak on one of my favorite topics. I've had an interest in China space issues for a long time, I'd say dating back to, say, 1992, 1993, when I was in Beijing uh, at, the, at the embassy. At the time we were launching, or the U.S. Uh, government was licensing either the sale of U.S. satellites to China or licensing the export of satellites to be launched on Chinese launch vehicles. Of course, this came to a grinding halt um, in the 90, 1995, 1996 timeframe. Uh, but since then, there's been, all the way up until now, there's been a remarkable change in the way China approaches their military space operations. M my remarks here for the next 10 minutes or so are gonna be focused primarily on the military aspects. Starting with some of the most significant changes that have taken place simply over the last, I'd say, five, four or five years or so. Um, before 2016, there were a whole range of organizations within the PLA that had some role, for example, in developing requirements for space capabilities. Uh, just to give some examples, within the former General Staff Department, Operations Department, um, you had three or four organizations, let's say, for example, uh, survey, mapping, and navigation, that was one part. Uh, um, you had weather and um, ocean oceanographic sort of issues. That was another part. Uh, you had um, uh, communications. That was a whole nother department. That would have been the uh, general staff department, informatization department, or communication department. You also have the intelligence organizations, such as the former general staff department, intelligence department, that was primarily on optical developing requirements for military uh, space um, electro optical systems. Uh, synthetic after radar systems, just a whole range of these organizations. The General Staff Department, Technical Reconnaissance Department, or the Third Department, of course, had their own requirements, as well as the Radar and Electronic Countermeasures Department. So there's a whole range of these organizations. Uh, in December of 2015, or say, you know, early 2016, a significant change uh, took place with the consolidation of these end users that formerly were under General Staff Department and to some extent under the old General Armors Department and bringing them together under one umbrella organization. And that is the PLA Strategic Support Force that uh, Dean uh, mentioned. So bringing all these together under a subordinate department within the PLA Strategic Support Force called the Space Systems Department. So what they've done is um, what they consolidated was the space transportation of the space launch infrastructure um, and that includes your key launch bases like in, in Taiyuan or in um, uh, Jiuquan or uh, Xichang and now of course Hainan. Bringing those, uh, that part of this and then linking that with the uh, space situation awareness infrastructure or the track uh, or the tracking telemetry and control parts of this under base 26 uh, headquartered in Xi'an or, or Weinan um, and bringing all these together on, under one umbrella. So what it's really done is 
added, it's, it's made the system in terms of developing requirements much more um, e efficient. Um, and it's hard to get a grasp on exactly what roles different organizations have within the Space Systems Department, but, but, um, but th this part of this is significant. It also, of course, helps in terms of program management for the um, re research development acquisition of military space capabilities. Um, there, there's also the uh, uh, infrastructure that has, has existed. Nothing much has changed really in terms of the space launch infrastructure and the uh, on orbit and, and, and the um, uh, launch tracking and control of, of, of space. That, that part of it hasn't really changed much. That just brought over and now, but they're now integrated with the end users and that is gonna have an effect on uh, making the whole system uh, more more efficient. Um, Engineering R&D, of course, the for PLA systems, um, they're going to be rely heavily upon two large defense industrial enterprises for their engineering research and development, or uh, engineering R&D, the system engineering that, that Dean mentioned. Uh, of course, these reside within two uh, uh, large enterprises, uh, China Space, uh, China Aerospace um, Science Technology Corporation, or CASIC for short, and then some role that exists within China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation, or CASIC, particularly the, fir uh, the, the CASIC First Academy uh, when it comes to microsatellites and to some extent uh, space electronic warfare. So this is um, significant, but within, there's some degree of competition, uh, but in terms of major, in terms of, of uh, uh, um, supplying the PLA with their main launch vehicles, really what you have are two academies, which are profit loss centers within uh, CASIC, that would be the first academy or China Academy of Launch Technology, and of course the Shanghai um, uh, Aerospace Academy. So that uh, that develops the uh, and, uh, manufacturers a little much more. So there, there's some significant um, uh, infrastructure that goes in all the way from satellites uh, to uh, to launch vehicles and the telemetry tracking control parts of this that go on, and that's a different organization. But so it, that's um, th that's significant. On the end user side um, for space. There's still some um, I see, there's still some questions about exactly how they organize uh, within the strategic support force uh, in terms of and what they've done with uh, as, as Dean mentioned taking the space applications part of, of, of the mission dividing that of course from the launch part and then subsequently also having a separate organization responsible for the space situation awareness so there's a lot that goes on and uh, sort of wrap up my uh, my portion by talk a little bit about the counter space aspect. I think Dean is spot on that um, uh, about the difference between um, a, a mission kill, for example, against a satellite by using electronic countermeasures, ground-based electronic countermeasures, maybe even space-based electronic countermeasures to go and, um, and complicate uh, the effectiveness of, of U.S. and other um, nations in terms of their, their ability to use uh, space information. Um, here is there's on the kinetic kill side of things, um, I still haven't come to a conclusion of, about who exactly has this responsibility. Uh, if there is a organization that actually has this responsibility on the kinetic kill side, presumably it could be Rocket Force, maybe Street Support Force, but it's, it's not clear. But on the electron, on the e ECM side, for example, uh, interfering with, um, uh, for example, U.S. or other countries' satellites uh, uh, through electronic means is uh, certainly the role of. Um, the PLA Chief Support Force. So that's just a very quick uh, um, rundown of some of the structural aspects of this. And happy to take uh, questions as they come up. Mark, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, we actually have uh, quite a few questions that have been uh, put into the uh, the Q and A uh, chat room uh, now. So I think rather than take up any uh, further time. Uh, speaking of myself, I think it'd be best to turn to uh, to some of those questions because we have some uh, some great questions that have been uh, uh, piped in for us. I think I'll start. Uh, we have a question uh, from a gentleman, and if I'm understanding the abbreviation correctly, I think this gentleman may be a, uh, a commodore uh, with the Indian Navy, uh, Mr. Basan Iyengar, uh, who has asked uh, uh, how the panelists would see the increased uh, weaponization of space uh, with the current. Uh, downturn in uh, relations between the uh, United States uh, and uh, and China, um, and he, as a follow-on question with that, he also asked are there areas in which there still might be some um, some overlap or some possibilities for uh, for cooperation. 
But I guess starting with the first part of that, would you have any response to that? So how do you, does the current uh, downturn in relations between the U.S. and China, is that likely to change or perhaps speed up the, uh, the weapon, weaponization of space? Well, from my perspective, um, it's important to note that both Russia and China created space forces in 2015. Uh, we're still getting ours off the ground. So for five years, at least, uh, the Chinese um, and the uh, uh, Russians have been pushing to, quote unquote, militarize or weaponize space. But that entire terminology is kind of silly. RAM, 20 years ago, did a study that concluded space technology is 95% dual use. Uh, satellite information, satellite communication, satellite uh, geodesy, all of those things, they serve military purposes and civilian purposes. Um, the point here being that we now recognize that in the event of a conflict, it will almost certainly affect space systems, whether that means you're killing satellites physically or jamming them or what have you. I think getting away from this idea that space is sanctuary does us a lot of good because it means that we're not going to be asleep at the switch. I mean, you know, I hate the term space Pearl Harbor, but the key point about Pearl Harbor was it occurred on a Sunday when nobody thought anything was like that could happen. Um, if we are aware that our space systems are vulnerable, if we realize that our space enterprise, satellites, terrestrial data links are vulnerable, we'll pay attention to that. That's useful. In terms of cooperation with China, there is any cooperation right now due to a number of things, including the Wolf Amendment passed by Congress, but also because um, for those who think that we should cooperate with China, I invite them to basically plug their laptop into a Chinese network. Uh, I, I suspect that most people on this, uh, in this teleconference probably wouldn't want to do that. Why you would therefore want to invite the Chinese into your space infrastructure uh, to, you know, produce satellites or you know, uh, share data, quote unquote, uh, has always left me somewhat puzzled. Okay, thank you, let's see. Everyone, do you still hear me? Um, I think I've got a question here uh, sent to us from Mr. Uh, Jared uh, Keller, who is asking both speakers, uh, would you mind speaking a bit to the scope, scale, and nature of the relationship between uh, SASTIN and perhaps other entities in the um, uh, defense industrial complex and the strategic support force, which is kind of a broad uh, question. And in reading that, one that occurred to me that I might tack on to that myself is, um, do you have any sense or do we have a current understanding as to how perhaps requirements might be communicated or transmitted from the strategic support force to entities in the uh, defense industrial complex for in terms of new developmental technologies. Do we, do we know much about that? I think Mark would probably be in a good position. I, I can um, give it a, a first shot here. Um, of course, Sastin uh, has, a dual, uh, has, has a dual hat. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Dean, correct me or others, correct me if I'm wrong, but. The director of Sasson, I believe, is dual-hatted as the director of the China National Space Agency or, or administration. Um, and CNSA, of course, uh, plays a significant role in some programs, like, for example, I think the lunar program may be a large system engineering effort that they undertake, you know, through Sasson um, to be able to sort of organize the whole defense, um, be able to mobilize the defense industry. For that, that particular purpose. Other programs, of course, can be overseen by, by the PLA, but th that's um, th that's a significant role that SASTIN plays. Anything that has to do with military civil fusion, of course, SASTIN is going to pl play a role, um, and one would have to break out exactly what the membership is on whatever commissions or committees exist on military civil fusion that's related to space. Um, so, but in general, uh, when it comes uh, to civilian programs, SASTIN Sasson's role when it comes to overseeing research development acquisition is going to be much more significant. Sasson, of course, also develops policies for defense industry. Uh, and when you have a program that is significant and cut across a lot of the uh, defense industrial enterprises, the large ones, uh, the role of Sasson is going to be much, much, more, much more significant. Uh, Dean? Uh, yeah, to follow up on Mark's point, actually, the head of CNSA is a deputy director okay, there you go. of Sasson. So it's not even the head of SASTIN. 
uh, which gives yeah. you an idea of how far down the bureaucratic pecking order CNSA is. Hmm. Uh, so it, it's, it's a shadow of a NASA uh, or a NOAA, uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration here in the US. Um, it's an interesting question how the technology and requirements feedback loops work. Um, China's military industrial complex has a mixed track record of being responsive to the military's demands. Um, the creation of PLA Strategic Support Force and the Aerospace Force in particular um, is an interesting question because previously Sastin directly interacted with the General Armaments Department, which was responsible for equipment weapons development. Now there's still an equipment development general department. So how does this war fighting service headquarters, PLASSF, interact with the producers is unclear. Um, just very quickly on the issue of civil military fusion, one of the things to keep in mind is that the Chinese have spent a lot of time thinking about mobilization. And they have different types of mobilization. So when we think about mobilization, we're thinking industrial mobilization, Detroit churning out Sherman tank. The Chinese have written a fair bit about science and technology mobilization, mobilizing people, mobilizing equipment, mobilizing facilities. That's very easy with state-owned enterprises like Cask and Kasich, but it also means the private sector, these new Chinese private commercial space companies are liable to be mobilized. It means university facilities, engineering facilities and equipment can also be mobilized. Um, so that's part of the civil military fusion aspect is, again, not just the people who are in uniform or the obvious big picture, you know, big ticket item in our parlance, the primes, uh, the Lockheed Martin equivalents, but also the subprimes and the tier three, four, and five producers would also be liable to be mobilized. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I think for our next question, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll be uh, turning to one that was submitted to us by Mr. Uh, Pavel Lujan, who's a, a Jamestown uh, uh, analyst or contributor from, uh, from Russia. And he asked the question, uh, according to the UCS satellite database, the PLA has only three communication satellites. So does that mean that the PLA relies for communications primarily on officially civilian and commercial uh, satellite systems? Uh, I'm not familiar with the UCS database. I find that number to be highly questionable because the Chinese, by their own admission, have at least two military satellite constellations, Fenghua and Shentong. Um, and I'm going to just do a back of the envelope assumption that if you have a, a, an entire system, you have more than one satellite. Um, it's also important to recognize that the Beidou has a backup communications capability. 140-character uh, uh, short message SMS capability, which in the Latin alphabet, 140 characters is a tweet, but in Chinese, that's about half a page of information and detail. Uh, certainly, China's military can access communication satellites, uh, its own communication satellites. I'll note that China has exported communication satellites to a number of other countries. Given their proficiency in cyber, I would be most curious to know whether they left in backdoors and access capacity to other, essentially other countries' communication satellites that they manufactured for. To, to, to just to echo what, um, what Dean said, um, I suppose there could be, you said only three dedicated military communication satellites in, uh, in GEO. Um, that, that may be the case, but um, you know, for how do you how do you account for like the um, uh, spe, you know the, the data relay satellites, for example, that that exists? Or my impression, these are a kind of communication satellite um, uh, as well. And I think there also have been tactical communication satellites, you know, small satellites that have been uh, launched that have relatively short um, uh, uh, lifespans. Um, and historically, the PLA has relied heavily upon renting transponder space. On a whole range of other China or like a whole range of other communication satellites that, that are that are up there. So yeah, I mean, it may be true only only three, um, but very narrow uh, definition. And I suspect, as Dean does, that it's um, more significant than, than that. 
Mm. Okay. <clears throat> All right, our next question is one that uh, was submitted to us by Mr. Brian Ellison, who's asked, um, uh, how do we see Chinese views on escalation uh, in space changing? And I think that's uh, referring to uh, the, the space warfare. Uh, he says, are there any recent Chinese doctrinal sources that we can point to since the establishment of the strategic support force? Uh, that provides some sort of a better uh, understanding of PLA doctrine regarding uh, escalation in space warfare. Uh, since the creation of the PLA Strategic Support Force on December the 31st, 2015, I'm not, there have been some Chinese military, you know, People's Liberation Army daily articles and things talking a little bit about that. I think we are still operating largely off of uh, Chinese uh, military textbooks and doctrinal material that predates that. Um, uh, one, I'm not sure the doctrine has necessarily changed. Uh, with the P creation of the PLA strategic support force. Um, so, because that's a very high level, sort of 30,000 foot, how do we think about space force employment as opposed to who does the targeting, what is the organization of a um, Chinese ASAP battalion or something like that, which I think has taken off since the creation of the PLA strategic support force. Mm -hmm. um, it's also useful to note here that the Chinese are tied to five-year plans. So we should expect to see a couple of things with the impending 2021 to 2025 timeframe is one, a new space white paper, which will mostly talk about more non-military space. But we may see the issuance of new Chinese military teaching material, uh, which is uh, about due um, because we are ending the first phase of Chinese military modernization uh, around 2020. So we should probably expect to see new Chinese textbooks uh, new Chinese doctrinal materials, um, et cetera. Uh, I will just note that uh, the Chinese currently are talking about uh, the military strategic guidelines uh, for the new period under the new circumstances, which seems to be uh, about the post-2015, 2016 creation of new forces. So again, I would expect to see new doctrine emerging. Whether we'll ever see it is a different issue, but I think that there'll be issues. If I could just um, just a, a very quick uh, piggyback on that. Uh, this is one reason uh, the escalation issue. I assume what's being referred to is, um, uh, for example, the kinetic kill aspects of anti-satellite uh, op operations. Uh, this is one reason why I uh, just as a as a as a working hypothesis or even theory theory why uh, if if there is an operational capability that exists, it's certainly been tested, but operational capability and uh, units assigned that mission. Um, one reason why I think that the PLA rocket force has this capability, because bear in mind that you know, uh, the rocket force, of course, is tightly, uh, at least on the nuclear side, is tightly controlled by the Central Military Commission. And I would suspect that, that uh, because they're used to that kind of control, um, that if there is an ASAT, kinetic kill ASAT mission, direct ascent, that that mission probably would reside under the rocket force. Um, because that's directly under the, uh, theoretically sheep support force is also under CMC, but um, but the rocket force has a tradition of being very tightly controlled um, with the political at, and at, from the center. So I, I just add that that point. Okay, I'll say um, another question has been submitted that I think could uh, work well as a sort of a, a follow on to that one. Uh, Mr. Charles Ludlow has uh, has written in. Um, in regards to escalation, uh, would an attack on a PLA space-based asset result in terrestrial escalation? Uh, or would it be likely uh, limited mm -hmm. to, the, uh, to the space environment? Uh, would either of you have any uh, thoughts on that? I mean, that's a theoretical that's probably difficult to, <laughs> might be difficult to answer, but um, would either of you have any thoughts on that? So I wanna emphasize here a fundamental divergence between Western thinking about space, quote unquote, space deterrence and cyber deterrence, and how the Chinese think about space and cyber deterrence. We talk about space deterrence as how do I deter somebody else, China, from attacking space assets or attacking our cyber network. The Chinese, when they talk about space deterrence, is what can I do in space to effect deterrence elsewhere? 
space, in a sense, doesn't matter as space. Space matters as part of, again, comprehensive national power. So let me flip that question first on its head. The Chinese may or may not attack a, somebody else's space systems because they are focused on a Taiwan scenario or a South China Sea scenario. We are far more likely to say, hey, don't touch those satellites without thinking about, okay, what does that do with regards to the Taiwan or South China Sea situation that's evolving? So an attack on a Chinese satellite is most likely going to be seen by Beijing as, huh, what is the geostrategic thing that this is tied to? And so a response, if it's about ongoing tensions in the South China Sea, is far more likely than to see some reaction to the USS Mustard or downing a UAV or shooting a B-1 out of the sky than, oh, you hit a satellite, I will therefore it for TAT, respond with a satellite. Again, already since the Chinese are thinking holistically about space, even if they try to limit themselves just to space things, that means that they might decide to cyber shut down GPS or cyber or blind a satellite ground station. So, you know, this is, this is the thing is that we are thinking space for space and space is important for space's sake. The Chinese are saying, no, space contributes to this bigger picture. How do I affect the big picture? Yeah, okay. All right, thanks, Dean. Um, again, quite a few uh, great questions have been uh, submitted, uh, submitted to us. Um, the next one I think I'll ask, this one uh, was sent to us by Dr. Vera uh, Ratsaborinska in Brussels. And she had a general question regarding the, uh, basically the, the state of military capabilities in space between uh, Russia, China, the United States, and, and other powers. And she asked, you know, how would you assess the, uh, the state of fu the future operational environments in space? And I guess perhaps taking it out uh, 10 years, maybe 20 years, uh, if we were to look, for example, at those three great powers, so Russia, China, and the United States, would you have any sort of, I mean, that's a very broad general question. But would you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think that the broad response to that is we have a highly asymmetric set of circuits. Russia's focus is first and foremost on its near abroad, the Baltics, Ukraine, these days Belarus, uh, and secondarily someplace like Syria. You don't need satellites to communicate with Russian military forces on the borders of the Baltics or with little green men in Ukraine. Um, China is the same way. The bulk of its security focus is on Taiwan, and then the South China Sea, and then the East China Sea, and then the Sino-Indian border. Djibouti is, is a nice thing to have. So China doesn't need satellites, not for reconnaissance, not for communication. We're the ones who play an away game. We're the ones who are going halfway around the world, whether it's to help defend Taiwan, or to help defend the Baltics, or to intervene in the Middle East. We have to have space. The geometry is simply laid out that way. Um, they, these countries don't. That creates a very fundamental asymmetry in terms of vulnerabilities. It creates a fundamental asymmetry in terms of what happens if space were a foul nest. If I simply fired 20 dump trucks worth of gravel into orbit, all satellites die. Who is worse off? There are diplomatic and political effects. I'm not saying any country is going to do that. What I'm saying is, if all space systems went away, who would be most affected? Asymmetrically, it would be the United States. So that assessment of who is ahead, you have to start from who needs space most. And you know, the other thing to keep in mind is China in particular has seen a, an America that is heavily dependent on space. The Chinese are not in the habit of repeating other people's mistakes. So this idea that China will inevitably look like us is rooted in a fundamental assumption that China is going to look like us in general. Last I looked, a country of 1.3 billion people with 5,000 years of history doesn't actually look like us at all. Why you would assume that they would have to look like us in space, again, muddles. But I have to admit, a lot of things muddle me these days. If I could, um, sure. Go ahead. If I add on to what uh, Dean said, I agree 100%. There is an asymmetry 
of needs for military in, in terms of military operations between the United States and, and China. I'm not, uh, not as, as familiar with the Russia side of this, but I would highlight that there are probably are two areas in which I think overall speaking, I, I suspect the US is technologically ahead if you divide, you know, if you chunk things down in their individual capabilities. I would say there's probably two exceptions uh, in the area of space. One would be um, in the area of space electronic countermeasures, uh, where I, my, my own sense is that China, that China and the PLA have been dedicating significant resources into this method of denying the US uh, ability to leverage our space assets. Um, I, I, I assume we have some programs going on, but just just the amount of effort that seems to go in into this within in, in the PLA is significant. Second area I'd highlight, um, it's kind of space, but it's called near space. Near space is that area, I mean, you could do a rough dividing point that space begins at 100 kilometers, but that's kind of arbitrary. Um, but near space is that area that you normally want to get through, for example. Uh, for example, when you have a, a man, man space program return to Earth, uh, and you watch movies, you'll see the area where you know, it heats up and you lose communications and, and things like that. It's that, it's that particular area. Uh, Ch China and the PLA in particular have been investing significant resources into, into leveraging that domain let's say between roughly maybe 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers up to that 100 kilometer, um, 100 kilometer uh, uh, aspect. And Dean's spot on when he talks about the, the Taiwan scenario, the United States would be very reliant upon uh, space assets because for over the horizon, beyond line of sight communications, basically got two choices, uh, space and then high frequency or HF communications. And um, I, the US had some near space act, uh, uh, programs a while ago. I don't know what, what happened to them or how active they are these days, but um, for China, near space is, um, provides similar capabilities that they, what they would get in terms of communications relay in terms of um, intelligence surveillance or reconnaissance, um, but they seem to be investing significant resources. Of course, there's also the hypersonic um, glide vehicle aspects of this that, that spend significant time uh, in, in near space to be able to uh, go toward its target. Uh, we have hyper some hypersonic programs, but China's been investing significant resources into this as well. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> uh, I think the next question to address the panelists is one that was uh, sent to us by retired Admiral uh, Michael McDevitt, who's a uh, senior fellow with CNA and has also been a longtime uh, friend of Jamestown. So we thank him for, uh, for uh, joining us today. But his question is, uh, commentators often speak about U.S. vulnerabilities because of our reliance on space-enabled networks. Uh, since China seems to be rushing headlong into the same sort of dependence on space-based networks, uh, is their vulnerability to war fighting interruption therefore also increasing? Any uh, any thoughts uh, from the, the panelist on that? I'm going to respectfully disagree with Admiral McDevitt, um, who I've known for a long time, uh, because I'm not sure that they, the Chinese are moving towards network-centric warfare, but not necessarily space-based. They are emphasizing the ability to create shared situational awareness, but it doesn't have to be by way of space. Um, it's interesting to note that, for example, in the last several PLA day parades, you have a lot of UAVs going through. The Chinese PLA Air Force is fielding a lot of electronic uh, airborne platforms. So I don't think they have to rely on space. And again, given the strategic contingencies they're preparing for, you don't need space to monitor Taiwan uh, or to coordinate your air forces and things, um, which are all taking off from land bases in China that can be linked together by fiber optics. Um, so uh, are they, they are emphasizing network capabilities. Um, but what's interesting to me about that is that's occurring behind the shield of the Great Firewall of China. Doesn't mean that we can't access it, but it makes it a lot harder. So going to, to Mark's earlier point, about how the Chinese are emphasizing space-based uh, or space electronic warfare, you have to wonder what else the Chinese are doing behind the Great Firewall, just in electronic warfare in general, and electronic counter countermeasures that we just may not have insight into. Uh, 
And then, of course, you know, I mean, when you have the Thousand Talents program, that also means that you've got access to American researchers, some of whom are doing contract work. Uh, very convenient. I'm not aware of a Thousand Talent program run by the United States that Chinese professionals are part of. Hmm. <clears throat> Uh, just to add what um, uh, Dean, Dean, Dean said, I, I, I'm, um, it's good, good question. Admiral McDevitt asked a great question. Um, I assume what he's thinking is uh, more distant operations, particularly by the PLA Navy, um, out of area, whether it's in the Ocean or whether it's all the way out to um, you know, Africa and, and, um, and other places or, or Central Asia, where there would be significant requirements um, for the capabilities that space uh, offers. Um, but just to echo what Dean said, for when it comes to um, contingencies such as Taiwan, I, I think their reliance on space is going to be much less than what the U.S. has. Okay, uh, thank you, John. I think for the next question, I'll turn again to one of our, another one of our international viewers, uh, and this question was submitted by uh, Bala Subramanian uh, Chakrasekar uh, with the Chennai Center for China Studies in India. Uh, and the question is, uh, the International Code of Conduct for Outer Space Activities is an important step towards making outer space more safe and secure for the conduct of various operations. Where does China stand uh, in this area, and what are China's perceptions of this? Uh, and I guess I, I myself might tack on to that, uh, that specific question, um, maybe taking a step back from that one particular uh, sort of draft code of conduct. What, uh, what would you say the PRC's stance has been towards international agreements intended to uh, regulate uh, state activities in space? Any, uh, any thoughts on that? I think China's respect for international agreements and treaties is well known. Um, it, its record seems pretty clear, whether it's of intellectual property protections under the World Trade Organization, uh, the treatment of Hong Kong under the UK, China joint uh, basic agreement, uh, the promise from Xi Jinping to President Obama not to militarize the South China Sea. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a track record that fills me with confidence uh, that China is going to abide by the International Code of Conduct, which I'm not sure has actually been ratified by anyone. Um, so, and it's a code of conduct. I mean, the South China Sea has a code of conduct uh, winding its way through the negotiation process. What we have seen is Chinese legal work. Uh, we, see the, we saw this with the South China Sea, uh, where China basically has said its military forces on the islands are self-defense and therefore not militarization. Uh, it has ignored the Permanent Court of Arbitration findings regarding UNCLOS. And before anyone says, well, America didn't sign UNCLOS, that's irrelevant here. China did, and so did the Philippines. And the Philippines under UNCLOS took China to the Permanent Court of Arbitration. China and the US are part of the WTO. Again, would you be prepared to share your intellectual property with the Chinese? Um, the Chinese conduct of legal warfare is to take treaties, agreements, et cetera, that they sign, reinterpret them often in a procrustean way, and then propound that new interpretation as what it's going to abide by. I expect to see that in space. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Um, I think uh, the next question I, I think we'll take, uh, this is, was submitted by uh, uh, Mr. Brian Hart, who's a research associate with uh, CSIS. Um, and actually, it, uh, I, I myself do not claim to be an expert on the Chinese space program. One area in which I myself have done just a little bit of, of writing is about the ways in which uh, the PRC has attempted to tie uh, some of its space-related services, but specifically the, the Beidou satellite, satellite navigation system to the, the BRI, trying to link those two together and to try to use uh, some of its space services as uh, another aspect of both uh, economic influence, uh, but of soft power. Um, but uh, Mr. Hart uh, has asked, how effective is China's space program as a tool for Chinese soft power compared to the United States? So China is largely targeting its launch and satellite services to assist BRI and developing countries. Is there a growing divide in how the U.S. and China approach international space cooperation as tools for soft power? Uh, would either of you have any any, uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, 
I, I would just say so on the Beto issue, um, I, I've long had the impression, I'm, I'm willing to be corrected, that at, from assistant engineering perspective and maybe even from a application perspective, the PLA role in that is pretty significant already from the very beginning. It long, it had, it's it long been very significant. Um, in terms of using space as an instrument of soft power, I, I, was, I assume that they, 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 they certainly do. They, um, uh, they've been a, a key supplier of communication satellites and other services to a whole range of, of, um, of, of their friends and allies around, around the world. Um, so I, I would assume that it has a significant soft power role and I appreciate uh, uh, Brian for, for asking that question. Uh, Dean, I'll let you take the rest. I mean, China used space to create one of the first, China created international organizations, the Asia Pacific Space Cooperation Organization, and then uses it to tie in countries that are of strategic interest that may or may not have much space capability. Thailand, Outer Mongolia, and Pakistan. Um, the sale of satellites is noteworthy because of where they are physically located, countries like um, you know, Belarus, or the resources they have within them, Bolivia with copper and lithium, uh, Nigeria for oil. The one thing to keep in mind is that the Chinese do often think long term. For the, the audience out there, how many of you, one, have your own car? If you don't have your own car, this question is going to be less relevant. Think about the following. A young person who has just graduated from college, who is buying their first car, if they buy a Scion, which is the Toyota low end brand, they will become accustomed to the ergonomics of that car, where the windshield wipers are, where the light switch is, where the climate control is. When they graduate to a better car, Toyota will automatically have an advantage over GM, over Honda, over uh, Volkswagen. As that person then continues, hopefully, to become wealthier and moves up to luxury brands, they, again, Lexus will have an advantage over BMW, over Cadillac, over uh, Infiniti. So the Chinese, I think, we somewhat underestimate the impact of them getting their foot in the door with less developed countries when they sell them an entire satellite package, which usually includes not only building the satellite and launching the satellite, but building the ground control facility, training the people on that equipment doing checkout and insurance so that if and when these countries become more developed, are they necessarily going to at that point switch to Ariane uh, or um, Boeing or will they already be accustomed to, in a satellite sense, where all the controls are? Um, I think that we underestimate that longer term impact that I think the Chinese are banking. Okay, uh, we're, uh, I think we might have time maybe for one, perhaps two more questions. Um, but uh, I think the next question I'll direct to you gentlemen uh, is again one, excuse me, one submitted by one of our uh, international viewers uh, from uh, Satoshi Nishihara. Uh, this might be a little more specific. and <laughs> I don't know if uh, uh, you'd like to respond to this one. Um, but the question is, um, in June, the EMP Task Force on National and Homeland Security issued a report on China's ability to conduct an electromagnetic pulse attack on the United States. Uh, Dr. Peter Pry, executive director of the task force, says China now has super EMP weapons, knows how to protect itself against an EMP attack, and has developed protocols to conduct a first strike attack. How is the current situation? Uh, would, would either of you gentlemen uh, uh, wish to or feel comfortable uh, commenting on that one? I can give it a short jab. Um, I'm actually not aware of a recent EMP task force. There was, I think there was one back in 2005-ish, uh, uh, quite a while ago. But in, in general, I, um, I assume that the issue here they're talking about is non-nuclear EMP, uh, maybe nuclear driven or something like that. But um, in 2005, it was a, um, uh, um, a HIM burst, um, high I forget what it stands for, but basically it's a high altitude EMP burst, maybe 30 kilometers above the uh, atmosphere, for example, over Taiwan or over US aircraft carrier. That theoretically wouldn't kill anybody, but uh, be able to knock out electronics by that short, that, by that burst, uh, that high altitude burst. 
Um, but the other part of EMP, I think that is worth uh, paying attention to, again, um, China's defense industry, specifically China Academy of Engineering Physics, uh, which is best known for its being the sole supplier of nuclear warheads to the PLA, uh, seems to be investing significant effort into more exotic sorts of EMP capabilities, uh, in, uh, specifically um, high power microwave, HPM. Whether or not, you know, how far along that they've moved and whether or not, and how, if this could be, for example, in, in point or attack against US satellites or against um, uh, the United States itself, uh, it's, it's not clear that they've been able to uh, achieve breakthroughs that would be able to weaponize a um, uh, high power microwave device uh, and have it affect a significant area. Um, but that, that's an interesting question, I think, one that deserves a lot more attention. Uh, is is the role of directed energy weapons um, and, and the role that it would play as an instrument of electronic warfare more broadly. All right, uh, I was gonna say we've gone over by uh, a, a few minutes. I didn't want to cut things short because this has been a great, uh, great conversation. Um, but uh, before, lest we go too far uh, over uh, over time, I think you might have to look to conclude. But I did want to ask uh, both Mark and Dean, both of you, um, basically for, for some final thoughts, and um, I guess a specific one would be, um, we've seen recently that the, the PRC has achieved a number of notable space milestones, whether it was early last year when they landed a, um, a rover on the, the far side of the moon, or uh, early this summer in June uh, when they announced that they had conducted uh, successfully the final launch to complete the, the Beto-3 uh, satellite uh, constellation. So we have seen some very noteworthy milestones for the PRC space program recently. I guess just to, by way of wrapping up, I'd like to ask the two of you, um, what would you see as any uh, other near-term milestones uh, we might see? I mean, is that gonna be you know, a, a successful Mars rover or Mars exploration? Uh, or is there something else that we should be bearing in mind? And also with that, just to ask if you had any final thoughts in terms of, of broad trends for the future of the, uh, the Chinese space program that, uh, that we should be on the, on the lookout for? Uh, let me, let me uh, say first off, again, my thanks to the James Japan Foundation for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, my quick concluding thoughts would be the following. Uh, we are on the eve of the next five-year plan, so we should expect to see some significant uh, announcements with regards to things that will be done in this five-year plan uh, that will almost by definition include the space station, a uh, Chinese space station. Um, we will probably see a, a new Chinese reconnaissance satellite constellation that will come out. We will see advances with Chinese commercial firms. And co by commercial, I don't mean the state-owned enterprises playing at commercial. I mean actually commercial firms. The reason why that's important is because those companies will also play a role in international standards, business standards. Uh, and therefore, tying it back to comprehensive national power, China's new initiative is China's standard is Global Standards 2035, or China Global Standards 2035. I think space will play a major role in that. These are all areas that I'm not sure we have tended to think about in that context of comprehensive national power. I think it will be very important for us to keep an eye on how the Chinese try to use commercial players to influence global industrial standards to ensure their own benefit. Um, sort of piggyback again on what uh, Dean said, first, best appreciation of Jamestown for, for hosting this event. It's a fascinating topic and happy to, happy to participate. Uh, the, in terms of um, things i have been watching out for would be some of your space um, some of the space launch capabilities. For example, uh, reusable launch vehicles. Uh, that's something to watch out for. I think uh, single, single stage to orbit sorts of capabilities. Um, it, it, some exotic capabilities like trans-atmospheric vehicles, I, I think are, are, are things, uh, things to watch. Beyond that, um, they, they tend to take a incrementalist approach, sort of a, a incremental in the sense of fairly conservative where they constantly are are doing incremental advances in their capabilities, whether it's space launch, whether it's situation awareness, space awareness, and whether it's um, or whether it's um, space-based sensors or uh, positioning, navigation, um, 
uh, sorts of capabilities, meteorological oceanographer. So uh, in, I think in their case, slow and steady, um, in their view, wins the race. Uh, it's the real breakthrough capabilities, I think, that could change really going to be the areas of um, hypersonic technology, uh, as well as new types of lo uh, launch vehicles that can um, that are economical and also, um, it, from their perspective, be more um, reliable, I think. All right, Jim. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mark and Dean, uh, both for uh, for joining us today. We really appreciate you uh, and your, your expertise with us. We'd like to thank uh, as well everyone who uh, who logged in uh, to uh, watch uh, watch remotely. We thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're glad you have you with us today. Uh, but I think uh, having gone over just a, a few minutes, but in a, in a good cause, I think we might look to uh, to wrap things up there. But uh, but thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. we'll see, and I uh, hope you'll join us for the next Jamestown webinar, and I hope all of you have a great day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.